do it. From New York, home of the Deep Space Niners, it's Isolate Night with Scott Rogalski. Tonight is Wednesday Night Baseball with former Major League pitchers Nelson Figueroa and Glendon Rush. And now, get up, get out of here, gone for Scott Rogalski! Ooh, ooh. What is this? Got some sweat marks on my Mets cap. Unprofessional. Or maybe it is professional. Maybe it's a sign that I play professional baseball. <laughs> Do you believe me? Even for a second? No. I wish it was my dream to play baseball, but here I am hosting a talk show in my apartment. Who am I? I'm Scott Rogowski. What is this? Isolate night with Scott Rogowski. But what am I doing tonight? I'm bringing that love of baseball, my dream of the major leagues, and combining it with my current reality, a Quarren talk show, 
to bring you Wednesday night baseball here on Isolate Night. I might just spin this off into its own show. Give it a new name. Uh, base, uh, base is loaded with Scott Rogowski. Uh, uh, Quarren, Quarren, I don't know. I'll figure that out. Uh, there are going to be some changes around here, by the way. Some changes are coming. Stay tuned for that. Maybe I'll announce it on Friday's show. But I want to get into tonight's show because there's so much, and there's so much in the news, folks. What's in the news? I was on Twitter today. Look what I saw. Look what I saw in the news today. You see this? To comply with social distancing, a luxury restaurant in Northern Virginia will have 1940s-era mannequins occupying 50% of the tables? Yeah, this is a real headline, folks. How do you feel about that? Going to a restaurant, sit next to mannequins? Of course, this is in Virginia, and per 1940s Virginia, they will all be white mannequins. They will, of course, be white mannequins only. Now, the restaurant has only been open a couple of days, and already three of the mannequins have accused Joe Biden of sexual assault. All those lifeless patrons in the dining room might seem creepy to some, but I don't mind it. I've eaten at the Friars Club. In fact, I've booked myself a reservation for this place. I figured it's my best chance to score a date with Kim Cattrall. Mannequin? Mannequin 2? Oh, my Andrew McCarthy? Who are you? You're watching the show. I'm glad to have you here on Isolate Night. And of course, like I said, it is Wednesday Night Baseball, which means I got baseball player guests, major leaguers, former New York Mets, in fact, Metropolitans, Glendon Rush, Nelson Figueroa. They're joining the show. But before they take the mound, I have something special in store for you. You know, longtime watchers of this program know that I love me some Corona content. Quarantine memes. Yes, I love them. You love them. They're everywhere. In fact, it's getting a bit much. It's overwhelming. This quarantine is dragging on. The content keeps pumping out. Constant creativity. It's too much to keep up with. That's why I have to enlist the help of a meme expert, a member of the meme team, dream team. Let's check in now with our senior Quarn meme correspondent. You can follow him at Tony Zaret because his name is Tony Zaret. Tony, Tony, Tony. Scott, it's great to be here. Have you been? Have you looked at these memes I sent you? I I, I haven't even had a chance to look at the memes you sent me. Because, okay. Because th that's the thing, Tony. There's just there's just too much. There's a constant deluge of quarantine content out there. But you are my man on the street. Yeah. And you are, you've got your, your finger to the pulse. So what's, what's going on in the world of memes? Well, first of all, I, I just want to sort of warn your viewers that these memes have been sourced from the, the, the sort of dark, dark web, uh, sort of evil, evil Reddit and um, 11 Chan. So sort of sites that uh, these are not for your sort of basic normie memes. You know what I mean? So people that are expecting to see, you know, bad luck, Brian, I don't know what the, what kind of level of memory, the sort of baseball audience uh, that's tuning in is at. They may still be on like the dancing baby or or, or stuff like that. So this is, this is, these are next level memes. These are very complex memes that, uh, you know, frankly, I wouldn't recommend sort of sharing them yourselves unless you want to, you know, maybe have the, the PC police knock it on your door for being too dank. Wow. So just, just, this yeah. is, this is a uh, high dank alert handle yeah. with air. With care. So these are so this this meme I found on an extreme gaming board. Uh, I can't even uh, talk about where it is, but uh, as it, you can see here, the you know relates to what's going on now. The government says you have to stay inside. That most people upset uh, us gamers. Uh, yeah, ah, ah. and uh, yeah, this is um, Scott. Yeah, you've heard of video games? They're kind of like a baseball type yeah. of thing. You can sort of do inside. And so this, uh, for those of us that whose lives are gaming, nothing, nothing has changed. Well, this is right. This, this really drives the point home that um, gamers are actually uh, in the minority of Americans who are probably okay with the quarantine. They're thrilled by it. Well, 
you know, I don't know, but that gamers are an oppressed minority, if that's what you're saying. And uh, I've been sort of using my social media as a platform for gamers' rights. And, uh, you know, finally, gamers are getting a chance to, to, to shine because, you know, frankly, we, we us gamers have not been pandered to enough. And things are changing with this stuff like this great meme I found. So this could this meme could be uh, leading some kind of revolution, perhaps. Yeah, I think so. I think pretty soon there's going to be entire sort of console computers dedicated. Mm -mm. Uh oh, I think the PC police might have might have actually hacked into the stream here. Tony, I think I think we're being attacked by some of the uh, anti gamers out there. I'm losing your audio. Oh no. This broadcast is getting too hot. This is too hot for the net. He warned us. Tony tried to warn us. These memes are too dank. Hello. Hello. Stream. Stop. Tony. Tony. Oh my Tony. God. Are you using can you hear me? Kind of, now I can. Thank God. Are you using some kind of encrypted software? I think we need to we need to secure the stream here because like you said, this is this is too dank for my yeah, well, I'm streaming from my state-of-the-art gaming computer. It's uh, called the Commodore uh, 6.4, and this is the sort of next next level in gaming, the, uh, well past things like the Commodore 62 and 63. So probably your broadcast just couldn't handle the, the bandwidth because wow. we're talking 55, 56 baud's per modem. So I'll, I'll accept responsibility for that. All right, well, let's hopefully uh, we can shore things up here. I'm going to plug into the Ethernet cable. All right, what else do you have here, Tony? All right, so this next meme, another one I've sourced from an extremely dank portion of the web, but uh, I think the way my screen is, I'm sort of uh, on a little bit of a lag from you, so I'm sort of waiting till the next thing comes up. What I'm seeing, I think, is, is your producer's um, software. So I'm back. that's actually what I'm seeing, not sort of you. I'm sort it's of seeing a stream of him. Yeah, it's not. I'm not seeing a meme. I'm seeing um, just a lot of kind of like a uh, some kind of audio recording program. But let's get this new meme up because I can't wait to talk about it. I mean, all right. But the audience is missing out on what I'm seeing, which is um, a screen share of uh, maybe a Adobe something from the Adobe suite. Okay, so yeah, this is powered by Hovercast, Tony. Yeah, so here we go. I mean, Hovercast had a great app, and what I was just saying was that Hover. Cast is an absolutely amazing program of functionality beyond anything anyone could imagine. Anyway, Same transitions. All right, what's this? So, now this meme is another meme. This is a, you know I like to get a little political with my memes. I think memes have kind of are kind of the most important form of political discourse now. They've sort of replaced the newspaper, the editorial, the book. And speaking of the book, this meme uh, that I found uh, really reflects how important memes are now. It says uh, out of toilet paper. Just use this, and it's a li liberal book by uh, Obama, and that's a, a term those of us in the memo sphere use to sort of explain, you know, Obama's, you know, failure to kind of promote the gamer agenda. He in Obama, he didn't sort of earmark any money. Everything was going to the to the sort of solar energy, and uh, didn't invent a new PlayStation that gets you a girlfriend. So we're mad, and that's why I made this meme. And it says, a liberal book by Obama. And we've got, ah, perfect for my, we know the word. We know what we do with toilet paper. And this is a quote from the great John Waynes. Mm. <laughs> this, yeah. is, this is tapping into, yeah, there's a lot of rage out there. A lot. Of yeah. And, you know, this is the great thing is that, you know, obviously since John Waynes passed away, I'm not sure when, but, um, you know, we can... Yeah, probably recently, but, but now we can, this is, I, I sort of, I've been doing some kind of Ouija board stuff, and he told me this is what he would say, were he alive, and there was a liberal book, because he he hated liberals. Uh, he was a, he, he was a big, uh, uh, um, big Mitt Romney supporter, I think, maybe. I'm not sure when he died, but too too soon. Wish he one was still around. The, one of the Romneys. Yeah. What else? Here. So yeah, okay, keep them going, keep them going. I know I'm yeah. getting a little long-winded. All right, so now I'm going even more political. This meme uh, is from the darkest web. This is a, this is a web that's so dark it's you can't see it. I just clicked download because I couldn't even see what I was looking at. The web is so dark. This is we tell the lies, the government. We sell the lies, the media. Here they are lying about there's a virus, and finally we reveal the lies, 
And these are the heroes on message boards. Um, these are men in their 50s and 60s who sort of recently upgraded from dial-up and they're ready to share the special info they've got that the rest of us are not a party to. And, uh, and that's that's the message of this meme. Like, let's finally start listening to 58-year-old white male shut-ins because they're digging up info uh, that the rest of us are never going to get. Hmm. So right. that means... Off calling. This is hot stuff. You got anything else? So, yeah, I got a, I got one more meme. All right, I'm going to be honest. This this is not a. I made this one. I'm sorry. I know you told me to find memes about the quarantine situation, and I I stuck this in because I just <laughs> think it's just great work. And I'm I'm sort of sorry to you and to your producer. I didn't say I was going to do this, but it's just this is a picture of me normally, and then the second picture me when I go beast mode, and. Um, I'm sure you're, some of your uh, athletes that are coming on know all about going beast mode on the field, and I just sort of do it at home when I see when I'm making memes. That's the face. That's a that's a markedly different. Uh, yeah, you can see the difference between the top and the bottom. Is that also? I've seen memes that are like a me on Tinder, me on Facebook, me on LinkedIn. Yeah. Is is this a similar vein of meme? Yeah, but I would say much sort of better because it uses sophisticated terminology like like beast mo beast mode. Beast mode. I haven't, yeah, I haven't anyway. heard the phrase. Oh, well, listen, uh, Tony. Yeah, this, is, is. I, this is why I want to bring you on more often because yeah. I frankly can't navigate the meme minefield out there. Yeah, and now and the, the special protective equipment, the PPE, that's keeping you safe from these radioactive viral memes. Yes, exactly. I put on. I wear, I type, I wear, um, what do you call it? Gloves when I type up my memes because the dankness can sort of seep through the keyboard. But I mean, I have one more meme. I don't, oh, one I don't more. know if you're, yeah, I hate to sort of trigger your audience, but this one is extremely, this is a really epic meme. And, well, and here it is. Uh, it says liberals. And again, sort of a political, see, we need medicine to fight the virus. Chuck Norris. No, thank. I'll just, thanks. I'll just use my gun. I will shoot it. Ha ha. Norris. And this is, of course, the great Chuck Norris, I believe. Uh, this is from a meme account called Freedom Nation. Uh, and this this meme was about how we need guys like Chuck Norris. A lot of people are going, oh, the nurses, the doctors. No, fire them all. Get Chuck in there. And he'll 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 take care of the, the he'll take care of the virus. Have Walker, you heard of it? Stranger coming to our rescue again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Get, you got sick, have Chuck Norris punch the meme with karate. Um, and if Chuck Norris memes are kind of, those of you that aren't included in Chuck Norris, is a very new meme that just sort of came out in the last few weeks is uh, putting Chuck Norris in memes. So if you want to sort of be current, definitely share some Chuck Norris memes. There you have it. Ride that wave. Chuck Norris getting ahead of the curve as we try to flatten the curve here. Yeah. Tony Zarrett, senior foreign meme correspondent at Tony Zarrett. Give him a follow yes. if you want to stay up to date with more of these hot, dank memes. Thank you. Most up-to-date memes. Scott, thanks so much for having me. Much appreciated. How about that? A little bonus right. here on Wednesday Night Baseball. We, we mix it up with some memes. No baseball mm -hmm. memes, but, you know, that's we, we have plenty of baseball coming down the pipe right now. Like, uh, like now. Like right now with my first baseball guest. He was a crafty lefty who pitched parts of 12 seasons at the major league level for the Royals, Mets, Brewers, Cubs, Padres, and Rockies, and will always have a place in my heart for his performance in the 2000 World Series, the Subway Series, even though the Mets lost that one. He's also a great follow on Twitter. Let's say hello to Glendon Rush. What's, What's up, up, Scott? Mr. Mr. Rush, Rush, it's, it's Rush, Rush hour, hour, baby. baby. How, are How are you, man? man? Good, good to see, see you. Good to, good to see, see you. you. Do, 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 you, do, you do you appreciate what I'm rocking here? here? I don't know if you, I, I even show this off properly, properly but this is, I got, I got the, oh, the, oh yeah. yeah. Shay goodbye. Farewell, Farewell to Shea Stadium, Stadium, which you pitched in. And, and on, on the back, back, I have two of these shirts, Glenn. On the back of the shirt, I was looking for you, but no, there's Keith Hernandez, there's Doc Gooden. I don't see you there. Mike, Mike Piazza, Piazza and Seaver, but no Glendon Rush, Rush, unfortunately. What a bummer. Um, but, but you, my friend, you were part of those great Mets teams from the turn of the century and so many other teams. So much to talk about you, Glenn. First of all, it's a pleasure to, uh, to meet you, my friend. You've 
You've been a good follow on Twitter for many years. Um, how are you, uh, first of all, how are you handling this whole lockdown as we enter what seems to be like our third month? I'm, I'm actually doing good. You know, I'm fortunate. I'm in a, in a, a place where I can just hang out and spend time with the family and I, I don't have any, any job right now. So, uh, so I'm a, a retired dad and, and husband. So just chilling and trying to stay safe. The whole world now feels like a retired dad, isn't it? And that's, we're catching up to re like retired ball player status. That's how we're feeling. Yeah, I don't know if that's a good thing, especially with everything closed. You can go a little stir crazy, but I, yeah, I'm hanging in there. How about you? Are you feeling good and safe? Yeah, you know, this is this show has been fun, man. I, I've talked to uh, so many uh, great ball players, past and present, and um, I'm excited to get into this with you and, and Nelson Figueroa later on tonight. But I wanted to start with you first of all to talk about your early days with the Royals. And, uh, you know, because, look, you debuted in 1997, which was, like, prime Scott Rogowski baseball card, baseball fandom. I mean, it was I was peaking, 97, 96, frankly. Your Bowman rookie card, I'm a proud owner of it. I got your 96 best auto card. How many of those did you sign, those auto cards? A bunch, yeah, a bunch of those. That was good. <laughs> that, was the, that was the only way you could make money when you're in the minor leagues at that point in time, yeah. Right, so I've, I I was a big Glendon Rush collector, and look when you when you debuted, uh, you were a sensation, man. I mean, you were first of all you were among one of the youngest players on that Royals team as a 22 year old in '97, and I don't know if you even realized this at the time, maybe you did, but there were three of you guys who were 22 years old on that team, three pitchers: Jose Santiago, Jose Rosado, and you were born days apart. Santiago November 5th, you November 7th, and Rosado November 9th. Yeah, we were all close. Yeah, we all came up together, and uh, it was fun, fun times. And and uh, you know, to get that opportunity as a as a real youngster, especially kind of um, that was a, a an era of tons of old time veteran guys still around, and and Hall of Famers, and getting to see you know Paul Molitor and Cal Ripken and Eddie Murray and all these guys that were still playing at the time was pretty awesome. Right, because when you have that generational gap being 22 you grew up watching these guys play on tv and it's one of those surreal moments when you're now in the game with them pitching against them who was that first guy that you faced where you're like holy crap i'm i'm in the major leagues and i'm facing one of my childhood heroes uh probably paul molitor was he was in the lineup um in my debut against the twins so the, yeah that was definitely a a double tape looking in at him and, and seeing him in the box and then of course you know being a seattle guy growing up watching Griffey and Randy Johnson and Buner and that whole crew, Edgar. Um, so facing Griffey and those guys in the kingdom for the first time was was pretty amazing. Yeah, because you're not that far removed, right? Six, I guess, uh, 90 when Griffey debuted. You were uh, 15 years old. I mean, you're yeah, in high school. Yeah, I was in high school watching watching those guys, man. So to, so to get an opportunity to, to compete with them was pretty cool. That's wild. And speaking of wild, you overlapped on that 97 team with the wild thing, Mitch Williams. Yeah. I need to hear about Mitch coming out of retirement, attempting a comeback, didn't quite work out. What do you remember from, from that experience? Uh, he Absolutely phenomenal dude. So much fun. I mean, we had a blast in spring training. Um, I actually got to play some golf with him a couple times. You know, he was great to us young guys and, and uh, you know, made the team and then and then kind of had some struggles earlier in the year and, and uh, we ended up letting him go. But, man, it was, it was for me as being – you know, I, I look at baseball like you did, man. I collected baseball cards, and I was a part of all that that hoopla and, and, and watching games and everything. So as a fan and getting to be a teammate with Mitch Williams was uh, unbelievable. I mean, the, the 93 World Series, of course, he's famous for giving up that home run to Joe Carter. And, you know, there's a lot of talk from his playing days of, of his of his attitude, his wildness, the wild thing they called him. Did he, did he temper a little bit when he was coming back in 97? Was he a different man? Yeah, you know, I, I I didn't obviously know him before then, but but he was so much fun. I mean, just carefree, happy go lucky, out there having a good time, and loved playing baseball, and and uh, still went out there and competed like he did when he was you know when he was doing it with the Phillies. Your Twitter picture is Kenny Powers photoshopped into a Glendon Rush baseball card. Kenny seemed to have some of that wild thing flared him. I think uh, there's speculation that he was based on Mitch Williams to some degree. Yeah, probably not far off. Yeah, Kenny P is my favorite. I love that show, and uh, I have a buddy 
back in LA who's an incredible artist and and he does all these baseball cards where he puts funny heads on them and of course he did a Kenny Powers one for me so that was a, a good gift it's a fantastic show are you merely a fan of the show and the character or do you see some of yourself in the Shelby sensation no you know what I wish I had uh, some more of his traits like I wish I had a little more of that fu attitude when I was uh, when I was rolling through the league it might have helped me uh, get a few more guys out no jet skis <laughs> no jet skis <laughs> Today is Bobby Valentine's birthday. I saw you uh, retweeted that, and you're talking about him. 70th birthday, right? Wow. Yeah, uh, yeah. We um, we spent we spent uh, we had a, a call this morning with uh, Howie Rose, myself, Bobby V, and Todd Zeal, kind of reminiscing about some of the the 2000 stuff since it's the 20th anniversary. So it was great to catch up with those guys. That's right. And yeah, Bobby was your manager, and I actually found a clip of him speaking at a dinner on YouTube where I guess he was asked, of all the pitchers he managed, who was the gutsiest in big-time situations? And of all the pitchers that Bobby V has managed, and there have been many, he said, and I quote, I don't know how you're going to feel about this, but he said, I had that left-hander who had nothing, and I thought he did a great job when we went to the World Series. He had grit. His <laughs> name was Glendon Rush. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, no, I love that. I love Bobby, and uh, and, and uh, we had a great relationship. And, and you know, he treated me uh, very well, helped me find a place to live up in Stanford, Connecticut. And, and uh, yeah, he was he was awesome. It was great to catch up with him today. Oh, you lived up in Stanford when you were a pitcher? I did. I lived there both, uh, both years I played in New York. I lived up there. Very cool. Did you go to his uh, bars that he owned? Oh, yeah, yeah. I was. I think I probably have uh, tendonitis still from my elbow from the Papa Shot game there at uh, Bobby V's. That's I crushed, right. that, crushed that thing. He's the mayor of Stanford, practically. Uh, yeah. But what is it about those big game situations? Because look, going back to that major league debut, 22 years old, he pitched eight innings, no earned runs. I mean, lights out. And then in the World Series, biggest stage, Yankees, Mets, you're you're pitching and you're pitching well. I mean, is, is there something about those big time moments that you you were just in the zen, in that Zen mode and whatever. I I definitely felt like I I zoned in well when when uh, big games were were on the line and and but, you know the playoffs were, honestly were a blur. I mean that was my first time in the playoffs. I was a pretty young guy. I just went out there and competed and and was ready to take the ball every day and in a different role. I'd never really been a reliever before. I was always a starter. So to get get uh, thrown down in the pen, man, I was ready to go. It was so much fun and and the excitement and the city was buzzing. And it was it was awesome. I searched for a Glendon Rush highlight reel on YouTube, and I came up short. But, <laughs> but I did stumble upon some historic homers that you served up. Oh, you're, yeah. They're certainly a part of history. Next month, it'll be 22 years since Big Mac, Mark McGuire, hit his 37th of what will be a record 70 home runs in a single season. June 30th, 1998, this happened. We got a clip, baby. Nice. And a long drive to left. Get a load of that one. Way up there. Upper deck. Number 37, another Mac attack for McGuire. Boy, oh boy, what do you think of that one? It is now a 4-1 to ball game as McGuire delivers here for the Cardinals. That's what they came to see, a McGuire home run. Yeah, Big Mac taking that one, taking a big bite out of that ball to the yeah. upper deck. He, he crushed it. I remember I went in on him, I think the pitch before, um, I went fastball in, and and he swung through it, and I'm like, well, let's go in there again, and, and it didn't get in there, and, man, that ball was absolutely destroyed. It, there's no way. They said it was like 472. I think it was like 572 at least. I did. You know, those were I, – I would go to games that year, 98, and you would get there early as a fan. You get to batting practice. That was part of the show. I mean, you paid you paid for the ticket to the game, but really you wanted to go to the batting practice. And at Shea Stadium, McGuire, he hit, I mean, it was every ball in bat in BP just 500 feet gone. It, it was absurd. And to be to be part of that on the, on the opposing side, I'm sure in the moment you're like, ah, oh, damn it, I gave him a bomb. But looking back on all these years later, you're part of history. It's pretty cool. Yeah, part of history, and we ended up winning that game, so I actually had a pretty good start, and uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, I saw ESPN's doing a 30 for 30 on on that summer, of that home run chase, so maybe I'll get some uh, airtime in there, giving up the bomb. 
Well, you're getting some airtime tonight, right? You're getting a text that that the game <laughs> where you pitched uh, against Sean Green. This is this is coming up too. Ten ten days from now, we'll be marking the 18th anniversary of when you gave up six of Sean Green's record 19 total bases, a double and a homer on a day in which he went six for six with four taters. It's the greatest offensive output in Major League history, and Glendon Rush had a front row seat. Let's roll that. He had a chat with Rush here a couple days ago. Breaking ball hit pass first, a base hit for Green, as Terrace will score easily. Sean's on the way to second, and he's got his fourth extra base hit of the series in Milwaukee. Next pitch, and Green sends a fly ball to right. Ochoa has to go back on the ball, still going back, and this ball is out of here. A home run for Sean Green, and the Dodgers have a free run. I mean, had you ever seen anything like that, a player going going off like that? No, and, you know, it's one of those days where you're, you know, I got whacked early and I was in the shower and watching the rest of it from in, in the clubhouse. And those those are no fun, especially to watch the rest of your pitching staff wear it after you didn't go very deep. So that was a bad day. Man, a bad day. But uh, on the whole, you had probably more good days or bad days in your career. What would you say? I was like half and half, I think. <laughs> yeah. I would say that's a that's a fair assessment. If you're curious to find out perhaps why that's the answer, you should check out an article written a couple of years ago, The Curious Case of Glendon Rush. You, you got your, your ERA to your FIP. Someone broke down the analytics, and you're one of like these rare examples of a pitcher who pitched better than the record and then the ERA would uh, actually indicate it. So we can't get, get fully into it right now, but you know the analytics don't lie, I guess, huh? Let's hope not. Let's, you know, I, I had some rough times, no doubt, but I, but I definitely felt on the whole that I, I probably should have won a handful of more games than I did in my career. But, uh, you know, you can't complain. I, I, I was lucky. I was healthy and stuck around a long time. Yeah. Well, let's bring in a team of yours now from those 2002 Brewers who, along with Milwaukee, pitched for Arizona, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Houston, and my New York Mets across nine big league seasons. Fun fact. He is the only alumnus of Brandeis University to ever play Major League Baseball, and he can currently be heard hosting the Amazing uh -huh. True podcast for the New York Post. It's well, Figgy, it's baby. Nelson Figueroa joining the show. If we can make this work. Uh-oh, we lost, we lost his camera. <laughs> the technical issues with this remote producing stuff, Glenn, I mean, you have no idea how... Yeah. Or maybe you do. You've been doing a lot of these Zoom calls. And, and, I've been and, doing a bunch of Zoom, yeah. But uh, no, this is great. Let's get uh, we'll get Figgy on here. This will be fun. I know. Let's get him in here, Dan. Are we? How are we doing with this? We're seeing. Come on, Dan. Get it together. We, oh, okay. Oh, oh, we can hear him, Allison. We can hear him. So, Figgy, uh -huh. are, we, are we are we having an issue like we had the other night? No. Yeah. Hold on. Hold on. I think we got this now. Uh oh. Uh oh. Okay. There we go. Cameras on. All right. All right. Now we can get this thing working. What up, Sig? What's up, brother? Nothing. Oh, man. Frame yourself up. This there we go. No, I, I messed myself up, so then I had to clean myself up. So it wasn't, a, wasn't done by design. This was, uh, you got to make adjustments. You know what I mean? The game's all about adjustments. That's right. That's right. This is exciting. We got uh, we got two former 2002 Brewers, and I mean, the whole world has been talking about these 02 Brewers. <laughs> this was this was. Let's talk about this team. Let's just get into it. Uh, you lost 106 games. Dream team. <laughs> you, you you went through two managers: Davey Lopes, Jerry Royster. Yeah. What was what was going on this year, from your perspective? Uh, my perspective, I came in. I came into it three days into the season. I had been put on waivers by the uh, Phillies opening day and got picked up by the Brewers and met up with them immediately at the ballpark. And uh, Davey had already been uh, on the ropes uh, early on, um, and he didn't last much longer after that. I remember him giving us that speech. Uh, you know, he goes, "Guys, if things don't turn around, I ain't gonna be here much longer." <laughs> He wasn't there very long, and then he was gone. They uh, turned over the reins to Jerry Royster. We had Cecil. Um, we had Cooper. 
uh, was our one of our coaches, and he was awesome. Uh, with Dave Stewart was our pitching coach. Um, I'll never forget we had a. <laughs> this is one of my favorite all time uh, pitchers meetings. We, we all get in a room, we're talking, we're going over the scouting report, and Dave Stewart is sitting there and he's reading through the scouting report, and we start talking about uh, oh, it was a, a right handed against a right handed hitter. The right-handed pitcher needed to really throw his slider down and in on him to be effective. And Stewart's like, I don't even think that's physically possible. We're going right on right with slider at the guy's back foot. And just the whole report, he just crumbled it up and threw it out. And Glendon says to him, so what are we supposed to do? And he goes, what have we been doing for 100 years already? Hard in, soft away. Go get him. And that was the end of the meeting. Just yeah. Took <laughs> yeah, that was Stu. Hey, remember the other one? And we were playing the Astros. And as we're starting to go through the lineup, they're like, he goes, uh, first guy up. And would you drop Kevin Bass? Yeah. <laughs> he was going through the whole RBI baseball lineup. He's like, <laughs> use your bag while all in there. And we were cracking up, man. So Glenda was always good for a good laugh. It, you know, really kind of icebreaker. With, uh, and a year when you're losing 106 games, we needed a lot of that. Yeah, and Glendon, you, you, you know, both of you guys sort of bounced around uh, uh, different teams over the years. But, you know, when you join a team, how, how quickly can you enmesh yourself into the chemistry of it all or, you know, find your friends? I mean, I, it seems like you guys became friendly. Oh, yeah. No, without a doubt. That was one of the things where, um, you know, people have either played against you in the minors, you know, played against you on the way up or, or, or played against you in the major league level. I only had uh, a year with the Phillies and I had a couple of games with the Diamondbacks early on in my career. So for me, it was I was hopefully going to be given an opportunity to uh, establish myself and whatever role that was going to be in. And, you know, I'm sitting there you know, watching what the staff that we had, you know, they were big on prospects and trying to, you know, grow uh, homegrown products and things like that. But I was a guy that was more likely a stopgap kind of guy who could do the job. And, you know, you never know if, if I had the opportunity and I was able to fulfill my promise. And it was a tremendous opportunity to do something. But um, that that didn't come to fruition. But man, that that team had so many veteran guys that I learned so many little things, nuances of the game. I mean, we had Lenny Harris was on that team all time, who uh, actually, I think he wound up using your bats uh, as he go went on to break that record, Glendon, the, the B363s. Uh, yeah. Glendon Rush used to uh, pinch hit for us. when it, If it was a, in a losing situation and they didn't want to waste Lenny, hey, G Rush, go grab a bat, go up there and whack at him. He would go up there and get get his pinch hits. So, um, Lennon drop bombs, man. Three homers. <laughs> uh, it wasn't even the three homers that you know that actually counted. He talked about more, so it was like thirty bombs because he would extrapolate it if he only got get bats. You know, that, yeah, that, yeah. I would have got more abs. Yeah. That's what it was all about. It was just, you know, you didn't get enough ABs to pile up the 30 numbers and really take off. He was he was one of those guys that taught me to compete and go out there. You, you said early on, I was listening with Bobby V, you know, the lefty. He didn't have much, but you know what? He had enough, and he would go out there and battle and find your way because he had that mentality of, to do my job, I got to go deep into this ball game, right? Keep the bullpen out of it as long as possible and then hand it over to those we had some real flamethrowers at the back end of that bullpen, hand it over to those guys and see if we can wrap this thing up. If we went less than five innings, we didn't feel like we were doing our job. Um, and for me, I was a long reliever slash starter. So when I didn't have my opportunity to start and I had to be the long reliever, it was difficult to sit around and go, okay, the only time I pitch is if this guy's giving it up because it's usually a losing situation anyway. I was like, man, there's got to be a, a psychiatrist I can talk to, a sports psychologist, because this is a, not the greatest of roles. This isn't what I busted my butt, you know, all through high school, college, the minor leagues to get up to the big leagues to be the guy that, hey, just in case, you know, we're getting our butt kicked, you go in and keep pitching and keep us in a ball game. Because I, as we knew, I became expendable at one point. I think it was, uh, it was in Houston. We, uh, the starter got lit up. I went five and a third, maybe five and two thirds scoreless relief. I was subway sub of the game. And the next day I come into the ballpark and I don't even have a locker. I go to my locker and there's someone else in my locker. 
and they call me in the office and they're like, oh, uh, by the way, uh, we are, we're going to uh, try and uh, put you through waivers and we're going to send you down to the minor leagues. And I'm like, what do I need to work on? I threw five pitches for strikes. I, I just pitched my butt off last night and, you know, saved the bullpen. Yeah, but, you know, we might need somebody today or even tomorrow. Meanwhile, tomorrow we had an off day and it was a family trip. So I got to sit in the stands and watch my team play while I sat in the stands. <laughs> uh, one night late, you know, previous, I was pitching on the mound and doing a great job. Now I'm sitting in the stands and watching like a fan. Is that kind of team? They give you a stipend at least 25 bucks for some hot dogs and peanuts? <laughs> yeah, that's when I realized how much people were paying for beers and hot dogs. It was ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, that's why they're so angry at you. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, that those, I mean, look, we maybe maybe we'll do this again and I'll, I'll ask about Ben Diggins and Valerio de Los Santos. And I, I, I'm just, these are all guys because I was such a baseball car collector and prospect guy. I mean, yeah, all these, all these prospects. Look, Ben Sheets was a hell of a player that he had arm problems, unfortunately. But, man, Ben Sheets doesn't get talked about enough these days. Four-time All-Star. You, and you guys saw him early in his career there in Milwaukee. Yeah, Ben was a stud. That, that, you know, that's a perfect segue to, the, to these uh, stats I looked up. So I was having fun, Fig. You'll, you'll remember this series because it was right after uh, you joined us. Mm -hmm. I was on Scott. I, I, this, this series I talk about all the time with people to let them understand how good and and how good Barry Bonds was at the time, but but how we didn't want him to beat us. And so we go yeah. into this series in, in mid-April, so real early in the year, in 02, to face San Fran. Mm -hmm. and, the, and our three starters are Sheets, Fig, Figgy, Game 2, and Ruben Cuevedo, uh, Game 3. And, yes. of course, at the beginning of the series, you say, hey, here's our scouting report. Bonds ain't beating us, right? We're not even going to throw him strikes. We're not going to let him beat us. Way too early in the year. He just hit 73 homers the year before. I looked up what he did against us, and I'll never forget because I swear to God, we probably only threw him five pitches over the plate the whole series. <laughs> and I think he hit two of them foul for homers, two homers. He had five walks in nine plate appearances and went two for four with two homers. And Figgy threw a great game, too. Figgy went six and gave up three. Sheetsy actually threw a good game. And, and we won a game in that series, believe it or not. But to think yeah. about how incredible he was that we were going in there not even going to throw him a strike, and we only throw him a handful, and he still hits two homers. You know, that's something that I always talk about when people talk about, oh, the steroids this, the steroids that. And I said, listen, if, at that era – it might have been a level playing field because there were pitchers doing it as well as hitters. You still had to hit the ball, right? How many middle infielders did we see that were bulked up that still couldn't hit? Barry Bonds saw one pitch to hit maybe per game, and he didn't miss it. When I say he didn't miss it, it wasn't just a line drive somewhere. It was somebody needed to duck because a fan was going to wear it somewhere because he was that kind of special player. So when you went in there and you faced him, and I got to face him the year before, um, I remember when we went there and it was the first time I had ever had the Barry Bond shift done, right? Because they had the big wall in right. If he hits it towards right field, there's no defense for that because it's going in the water. So we didn't even have a right fielder. We shaded him to left and I'm looking around and I'm like, wait a minute. And we're going to go with nothing but split fingers. I'm like, okay. So nothing but split fingers down and away to Barry Bonds. Who, and we're going to play that shift that way. So if he pulls it off the wall, it's a double easy no matter what. And if it's a double, I'm lucky because it didn't go into the water. And I, I dropped like four split fingers in a row. One of, it, one of them got too much plate, and he hit a missile up the right center field wall. And I, I'm, I want to replay on this because I remember someone reaching over, and they caught it like right before it would have went into the stands, but they caught it right well within the wall. And I went running towards the umpire because the umpire is signaling home run. And I'm running towards the umpire and I go, didn't you see that guy reach over? Did you see? And he looks up at the, and he points to the scoreboard. And I'm like, man, that's rude. He just pointed to the scoreboard. On the scoreboard, it said, I think at the time he passed like Mickey Mantle or somebody like that. And he goes, sorry, kid, it still counts. <laughs> <laughs> the Jeffrey Mayer situation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, but I mean, it was he, he was that impressive. Where uh, it didn't matter who the pitcher was, he would face these guys who, you know, a, a reliever would come out of nowhere throwing ninety six miles an hour, blow a fastball by him, and then try to do it twice. You wouldn't get too past him. I know you guys are uh, love talking about the past, but you're also up on the present, and I'm sure you saw what happened 
well, what they're talking about happening this this June in the draft, MLB is announcing changes to the 2020 amateur draft. They're going to they're going to be cutting the rounds down from 40 to five rounds, That's which had already been cut down from 50 rounds back in 2012. And when you guys were drafted, you could draft up to 100 rounds. Mm -hmm. So this is like a major, major chain change for you know this is the first step to a big league career for all these high school college players every year. And I wanted to ask about the draft and how you guys feel. First of all, how you feel about that move? Because you guys have your own interesting draft stories. I'll start. I, you know, I, I don't get it. I don't get the um, the reasoning behind it I, because I don't think the value of what they're going to save in money really matters if you look four and five months down the road. So regardless of if the minor leagues don't play this year, you still want to put talent in your system and have them ready for hopefully instructional league, Arizona fall league, um, next spring training, all, all that stuff. So to me, it makes no sense at all. I, I think it's a short sighted, not a smart move um, by MLB. And, and I, I don't like it at all. Well, trying to save money. I mean, that's what it all comes down to money, 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 money. Yeah. But uh, that's also one of the things I think when you look at the draft and you look at where the how the pyramid falls down from how much you can each slot is allotted. Right. You, you go with those top five slots. Yes. There's still big money involved in five, even 10 slots deep. Um, I think what it is, is you're looking at. They can now control that market in a major way. Um, it, it's going to be weird because I remember when. Uh, who was it? John Patterson, Travis Lee. They had that loophole where they didn't get their contract offered to them within the first two weeks after the draft. And they wound up making, I think, combined $16 million to sign with the Diamondbacks rather yeah. than the team they signed with. And that loophole you know, created a situation where now all of a sudden they were free agents. And on that free agent market, they went to the highest bidder. So I don't know if teams are going to necessarily save money because now if they can sign – you know, uh, free agents and everybody's a free agent after that fifth round, then what? Like it, it really, it limits, I think it, it hurts the teams that don't have money. Um, and the, the big market teams that can afford to do it, they're going to sign all these guys to these contracts and be able to control them, you know, and into the upcoming years where they can really stock up at this point. Um, because yeah, five rounds of a major league draft, that's not nearly enough because of the talent that you need to, uh, keep replenishing at the minor league level. Um, it's scary. It's just a scary thought all the way around, right. With everything going on, because the minor leagues, um, not being available and you're only going to have so many extra players to keep ready just in case they need to fill in and the, the, at the upper levels. Uh, I, that's difficult. You look at the high school kids who are now seniors going into college and what are they doing, having to do now you talk about a kid starting out his pro career, you know, missing out on a year. That's a big step in development. You know, those, those pivotal years early on where it's either keep this kid, he's a prospect or he's not a prospect, right? The 22, 23 year old, well, a, a year now not being able to play the game. It's, it's a scary thought. And I wonder if they're having combines or something. I guess you can't even do that socially distance. This whole thing is so unprecedented because you got all these senior years that were wiped out from playing ball. I mean, the high school season is supposed to be on right now. And so how do the scouts and teams even evaluate the talent the right way? So, I mean, look, it's, it's a crazy situation, but I agree. I think uh, regardless, with, the, with the, the, the draft being 40 rounds, giving players a chance, because look, you guys were both late round picks. I mean, yep. a, a, a little, a little different circumstances. Glenn, I mean, you probably would have been a first rounder had you not signed the letter of intent. I mean, your your high school senior stats were absurd: 0. 0.79 ERA, 134 Ks to 15 walks. But you signed the letter of intent, so a lot of teams back up. Park with no lights. <laughs> yeah, no lights. Seattle. It was a lot of cloudy games. Hey, remember, uh, uh, who was it? Ryan Anderson, the Space Needle? Yeah. Where he, he played in the league. It was like a, what was it? A 2-1 uh, count. Everything. So he already had a strike on him. So he had to do this to two strikes at 6 foot 10 and yeah. throwing the ball almost 100 miles an hour. And they were like, his numbers were absolutely ridiculous. So, wow, that's impressive. But at the same time, Glenn, you, you were, you know, the Royals took a flyer on you, right? 17th round, they figured, what the hell? We'll draft this kid and see if we can convince him to sign. And they ended up doing it 
And then Nelson, you were a 30th round pick. So you really coming out of college, like that was your only shot really to get drafted late round and work your way through the system. So without these later round drafts, you guys wouldn't have been drafted even. Hey, Mike Piazza really, uh, you know, he set the standard for what us late rounders can do uh, when given an opportunity. You know, right. if we could only all be like Mike in the 62nd round, a 63rd round, I think it was. Uh, no, it, it's it's a potluck. It honestly is a potluck because I, I say it all the time that I, I, I've played with guys, I've played against guys who had the talent to pl be in the major leagues. The amount of luck that goes into it it's astronomical. Uh, I feel like I may not have had the best major league career, but I always, I relish in the fact that I went, I went down, you know, 12 times and I came back up 12 times. Um, that to me is, I could have been a one and done, you know, a cup of coffee. Oh, well, this guy doesn't throw 95, but every time I got an opportunity to prove that I could do it, it was something that made me viable and able to come back to the major league level. Um, so that chip on my shoulder from being a 30th round pick when I had played in the Cape Cod league against guys that were all going in the top 10 rounds. And yet I was an all-star. We won a championship. Um, and, and I felt like I could compete on that level, but of course I wasn't six, five. I didn't throw 96 miles an hour. So I was going to have to prove myself. And that to me was, was everything, but that opportunity just to get that opportunity and having a 30th round and a hundred rounds even, you know, because those guys never really pan out, but it's still for some kid who's been busting his tail his whole life, just to have that opportunity, even if it's for one summer, um, it makes it all worthwhile. I would have signed for a hot lunch, man. You know, drafting the 57th round, I would have taken it. That was my dream. I wanted to be an Expo's 40th, ninth round pick. That was it. <laughs> not, not the last 49th round. There but, you go. Glendon, I want to hear your story. Cause this is, you know, you hear about this a lot. High school phenoms sign the letter, but they get coaxed into that pro contract. Your signing bonus has never been reported. 27 years later, are you willing to admit it right here? Set the record straight. What do the Royals have to do to get you to sign? 25000 bucks. Is that all? That's all I signed for. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that I want, I know, want that case reopened. There's yep. no way. You know, no, you know the, the um, I think the the biggest part of my decision was I felt like I was obviously excited to have an opportunity to be a pro, but I felt like I was mature enough at the time to be able to be a pro, and that's the that that's you know Biggie knows that that's the hardest part is, is if you can be a 18, 19, 20, 21 year old kid through the minor leagues when you would be in college, and if you can handle that lifestyle take care of yourself, you know, have a halfway decent head on your shoulders and uh, learn what it takes to be a pro. Cause it's a long season. It's a grind and it's difficult. So I, I, I felt like I was ready to do that. And yeah, of course, when you look back on it you go for 25 grand, you know, a used Honda and, and a couple new pairs of socks. I mean, what else are you going <laughs> to, it's not like you're, uh, you're, you're making out that well, but, but um, when you look back on it, it's definitely, the percentages are stacked against you, but I was I was one of the lucky ones, and I, I I wouldn't change it for the world. Well, so I guess my question then is, why did you sign that letter of intent to scare off those teams when, you, frankly, you you really probably could have been a first rounder that year with those stats, right? You know, I don't think um, I don't think I even thought about any of that stuff because I kind of came on everybody's radar late as a junior, and so me when the University of Washington called me, my my, my beginning of my senior year and said, Hey, we're going to give you uh, a scholarship that'll essentially take care of your school. If you live at home and you can come play here. Um, I jumped at the chance. So I wasn't even thinking about the draft or, or, you know, posturing what I was going to do or anything like that. And, and, you know, I, it, it, it probably all worked out for the best. Could have added probably another couple zeros to the end of that 25,000. I'm sure. <laughs> I pushed. I pushed for twenty five thousand and the thirtieth round, and I got laughed out the building. I got twenty five hundred. So, <laughs> it, 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 it's seriously, it's one of those things. And, and Glendon hit on it: is that your goal always is to play baseball for a living, right? And that's all you can think about. Is man, I, it must be so amazing to play baseball for a living. That grind in the minor leagues, traveling to all those cities, taking the bus, eating peanut butter and jelly every single day, living five six in a two-bedroom apartment trying to make that 
people don't realize uh, like that class action lawsuit about, you know, saying how the minor leagues, you know, you're making uh, $2 and 50 cents an hour. It, it, it really resonated with someone like myself because, you know, the bonus wasn't it. It was just about the opportunity, right? Give me, let me get my foot in the door and let me prove to you that I'm way worth way more than 2,500 bucks. That's all I, that's all my plan was, right? It turns into a 19 year professional career and I played all over the world. So it, it doesn't happen to everyone, but that grind. And I talk to kids all the time during that grind. And, 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 you know, how many times did we pull the old uh, switcheroo on buying a TV and using it for 29, not 30 days and bringing it back to Walmart so that we got our money back. We can then use it to buy another TV. One of the other guys, the other roommates would buy it. And then uh, whoever was starting got the, the bed when, you know, the other guy got the air mattress, that, that stuff, it happened all the way up to that AAA level. Um, and, and here you are, you're one phone call away from the bright lights and everything else. And nobody can fathom what you have to go through to play this game. And that even if you're, you know, if you're married, you have a kid, you have a, a home somewhere else. Now you're paying two mortgages. You're, you, if you're driving a second car, that's two car payments. You know, everything is in half. You're sending money home. And, it very quickly, um, and you're worried about putting up numbers because you realize, you know, you could see it stacked against you, how many pitchers there are, how many guys are, uh, you know, just waiting to take your spot on that roster, whether it's double A AA or triple A. It's not very easy, and it's not the glamorous life. And a lot of kids who they sign, say, out of high school and the maturity level, which you touched on, Glendon, is huge because a lot of kids come out of high school and they've never even been outside of their town. They've been the biggest thing in their little town, and then they go to play pro ball, and it's like, mm, I don't really want to do it. We had a guy with the Mets who signed for over 800000 first round or a high school kid, and he had never been away from his mom and dad. Went away from his mom and dad for a summer in, in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, and you know all about that, Scott. And next thing you know, he quits. He's like, nah, I'm good. I don't really like this baseball thing that much. Was that Paul Jaroncic or something? Was that yes, that? Ryan Jaroncic. R Ryan Jaroncic. Yes. Is that guy you're talking about? Yes, sir. That was yeah. him. He was the first round in my year. That's crazy. I remember that. Mets first round pick. It's like, we just blew our money on this guy. <laughs> Could you imagine that poor scout that signed him and, you know, everybody's congratulated him. Oh, great job. You know, this is our shortstop for the future. Great job. And then the next year, the kid's like, oh, I don't want to play anymore. How about that scout? <laughs> you, oh. you, didn't, you didn't check in and have a feel that maybe this kid didn't want it nearly as bad. And like his dad was pushing him to do it. And then once he got away from his parents, and he didn't want to be away from he didn't want to be away from his high school, uh, you know, where he lived. He didn't want to be away from his friends. He didn't want to be away from his family. So he just, you know, said, you know what, I'm good. And I hung it up at the ripe old age of I think it was 19. You know, 90 percent of the game is half mental, as they say. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, I, I, I want to we're heading to the ninth inning here. I want to try a new segment that I've done a few segments with the ball players I've had in the show. But this is this is what I wanted to do and haven't had a chance. So let's get into it. Do you have a drink nearby? A drink handy? Can you grab something? I want to play a little drinking game here. I've got my kombucha. <laughs> the game is it's classic. Never have I ever, but we're making it baseball. So it's never have I tinkered to Evers. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> never, never have I tinkered to Evers. If you've done it, you got to take a drink. I also want to hear the story. We'll start. We'll start with some easy ones because I know some of the answers to these, but. Never have I ever hit a home run in a major league game. Well, I had a drink, son of a. Yeah, I, I haven't, but Glendon. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> you put, yeah, you hit a few. Never have I ever played ball in a foreign league. Just me? <laughs> Just you. Nelly, tell us about your experience with Taiwan. Does ball count? Uh... What do you think, Nelly? Yeah, when a ball counts, please. That's even scarier. You don't I'm know if you're going to make it back. I'm undefeated in Japan, too, by the way. One and oh. Ah, sorry about <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we're, we're seeing this Korean baseball now on ESPN. Fig, you played in Taiwan, and you were like a star over there. Yeah, again, uh, it's all about opportunity and, and going over there and, and making the most of it. Uh, it was... I was coming back from shoulder surgery and I was trying to prove that I was healthy enough 
to uh, make a return to organized baseball. I was in Mexico. I had 18 starts, 11 complete games, not a phone call. I left there and um, I was like, okay, what do I do now? And I get a phone call from a gentleman named Jerry Sung. And he calls me and he says, my name is Jerry Sung. I am the Jerry Maguire of Asia. And I'm like, what? Uh, like, this has got to be a you know practical joke. I thought it was Paul Baco, quite honestly. <laughs> next thing I know, um, this guy says, I want to bring you over to Taiwan. He goes, you may not even pitch. So for me, it was like, you know what? I'm going to get the experience. I'm going to keep training, get my shoulders stronger, maybe learn some new techniques of training and pitching. I'm going to go over there. Let's see what it's about. So they paid me more than I was making in Mexican League. They paid me more than that to go there as a backup. Guy gets hurt. I wind up going in, and I won nine straight starts there, including the game one, four, and seven of the World Series there. And um, all of a sudden, I was no longer Nelson Figueroa. I became Fegulo. And uh, we won the championship where, you know, we didn't really have a chance at first. And then, I, I don't know, it was just one of those moments that you, you you sit there and you watch movies about. It was actually like happening to me. And I never had that opportunity at the major league level. I never had that opportunity, you know, at any level. And to go over there where I can't even read the newspapers and what they're saying about me. I just see pictures and stuff. And uh, having that opportunity to play there, once I finished there, I came back and um, I had an opportunity to, to get back into ball with the Mets and I had signed with the Mets in 08 and uh, that put my career back on track. So about being at the right place at the right time, like I said, and being lucky, that, that was part of it. Both of you guys had experience with coming back. I mean, Glenn, you had the, uh, the blood clot that you had to recover from and you both spent time away from the big league. So it's, it's pretty cool that you were able to both get back there. By the way, we're playing the game wrong. If you have done it, you got to drink. That's the rule. Oh, yeah. Oh, see? I'm trying yeah. to get people messed up here. Let's let's keep this going here. Never have I ever used a foreign substance on a ball during a game. I mean, how foreign are we talking? <laughs> what did you bring back from Taiwan? <laughs> no. <laughs> For foreign substance, I, I tell you, the, the I couldn't pitch with the ball being too sticky. And so the only thing that I ever used was um the bubble gum with sugar when we went to sugar-free bubble gum for a little while there in the clubhouses that didn't work for me because i wouldn't get that stickiness that i needed like for my slide or my breaking ball um but i would be chewing bubble gum and i would go to my mouth and just use some saliva but it's a little bit of the, the sugar that gave me and years later you know you start learning the the, the fine art of different things to use and try to uh be able to control the ball which you know what i've talked to some hitters as an analyst, hitters would prefer that you have a feel for the ball and you know where the ball's going rather than the ball slipping and doing damage to them or, or another hitter. I was an angel on the mound. No sticky stuff. Oh, you're so full of it. I was like, hey, I was like Biggie. I didn't, I didn't, like, I didn't like anything sticky, so I didn't, I didn't use it. I used rosin, some, some wet hair, but that's it. Nothing else. I didn't use rosin until later on in my career. I really didn't like the feel of it at first. And then uh, once I became more of a, a reliever and going in there, knowing I'm going to use my, my slider a little bit more than my other pitches, it didn't work very well with the split finger because it would stick too much. And so we're going to that slider off. And that's when I started using rosin a little bit more. But early on in my career, I hated it. You've seen my numbers, Figgy. You know I wasn't cheating. <laughs> if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. Isn't that the phrase? <laughs> I've had this one. Never have I ever taken a ball squarely to the balls during a game. I wore a cup, so I'm going to say I never did that. But I I had some pretty uh, ugly-looking tattoos uh, yeah. all across my body. I the took old, the bad old ones. Guy. Yeah, I got some bad ones. I got a I got a uh, I took one off the side of the head in AAA. Uh, mm. Todd Helton fractured my wrist at my last start of spring training one year. Um, uh, and I actually pitched the first, I actually pitched the whole first month of the season with a fractured wrist. I just taped it up. Um, so yeah, I took some bad ones, but never in the nuts. <laughs> so lucky then. I, hey, I, I saw that early on in my career. I was in, uh, a ball down in, uh, Kingsport, Tennessee and Carlos Lee, um, was playing for the White Sox. We're playing against Bristol and the first two starters of the series, he knocked them both out the game by hitting them uh, back in the, in the, in the cup. Um, one guy, he split his cup in half. It was a one hopper that split his <laughs> cup in half. 
So I remember they were taking them off and I got to pitch the third game of the series. And I, first thing I did was I told the clubhouse guy when I got inside, I go, we got to go to a sporting goods store tomorrow. I got to start wearing a cup. There's no shot. I'm facing this monster with, with without a cup. I just saw him take two guys out. So he was a big yeah. You got to go to oh. many times. You got to go to medieval times and get some knight's armor. How about a chastity belt or something? You need yeah, to medieval times. That. Nice. Never have nice. I ever peed or pooed myself during a game. <laughs> we're both we're both drinking in that one <laughs> yeah it, it, there's just those big moments like glenda said he's a man about the big moments and sometimes you know you're not alone in the big moments sometimes you you don't want to leave the mound and you know take care of business things happen uh, uh, a bacon strip never hurt anybody <laughs> no george brett moments hopefully no, no, get that no, bad. no. No. Not, nothing that bad, especially towards the end of my career where things were popping up on screen in HD. That's where you get nervous about those little things. Early on in the career, you know, it blurs out. But I mean, look, I don't know. I've never seen or heard of a pitcher calling time to use the bathroom. You're out there. You're on your own. You could be getting beat up and have a 12-minute inning, and you're, you're stuck out there. Hey, you, that, that's where you actually pull the old, like, the hamstring is really barking on you, but you know, it's, you know, and this way you can walk gingerly into the dugout. So you, <laughs> they were just showing, they were just showing a highlight not long ago of uh, Jason DeRocher that was with us with the Brewers. I he, love Jason DeRocher. He threw a pitch, and after the pitch was over, he, re this is in Milwaukee, he ran straight off the field down the tunnel, and nobody knew what was going on, and I think it was because his jock broke or something. And at the time, yeah, we thought he either hurt himself or he shit himself or whatever. And he went flying off, but it, it ended up being his jock broke, I think. Oh, man. DeRocha was priceless. When he first came up to us and we were in the bullpen, he had the, he would do the movie voice, the movie guy voice. Oh, and yeah. uh, there was that commercial going around. This kid came up and he, I mean, he took the National League by storm. He had like a 1.8 ERA, was blowing people away, hard throwing guy, Jason DeRocha. And he would sit there in the, in the uh, bullpen. And he would look up and they would show like the little advertiser for the all-star game because it was in Milwaukee that year in 2002. And they show the advertiser for that. And he would go, Jumbi, Jita, DeRosha. <laughs> he goes, and the rest, the rest of the all-stars coming to Milwaukee. And we'd sit there cracking up, man. And we, he was just one of those guys that was so damn funny. Um, I remember we went to Wrigley Field. I used to play catch with him. And as we're walking out, the, the you know the bleacher creatures in Wrigley are yelling at him and they're like DeRosha DeRosha and he's waving you know and they're like man 1.80 RA wow you, you you're doing great DeRosha DeRosha and he's giving them the thumbs up and they're like you suck and he just had that defeated look on his face like oh my god yeah they bait you in they bait you in at Wrigley they get you there oh it was awesome we we had such a great time that that was one of our one of the fun guys on that team. That leads to my, my next one here. Never have ever, never have I ever let a fan's taunts get to me. <sighs> yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, and you can hear them when you're pitching in Montreal. <laughs> no, no, no. Pitching, pitching in uh, Milwaukee, you could hear them. At Milwaukee. One of the funniest things was, remember Billy um, was the bullpen coach, Billy Castro, who was out in the, you know, he's out in the bullpen with us. And they would always check the phone. You know, the starter would go in, and what they would do is they pick up the phone, and Billy would check and see if the phone is working to make sure that they had communication. One night, I remember the phone was off the hook. And so they're calling down, and they're getting that busy signal because it's off the hook. And no exaggeration, Dave Stewart goes, hey, Billy, the phone, it's off the hook. <laughs> Clear as day. And we all just turn around and like, hey, Billy, they're calling you from the dugout because it, it was probably 13,000 fans at that point in that, in that stadium. Nobody was there. And it, that, that was one of the things that uh, it, it was definitely a different environment when there's no fans inside that dome. Yeah. Na you know, National League is where you wear it because you got to go out on deck and you got to hit and everything oh, else. So that's, that really lets you hear, have it. Yeah. There was that guy in Montreal too, the super fan in Montreal that would sit there and tell you all about yourself and guarantee you were getting raked the next inning. Don't worry about it. This will yeah. all be over soon for you. I remember that guy. <laughs> and, he, and he did it in French too, you know? Keep oh yeah. Going. In between the <laughs> horns, the horns and the seat backs rattling yes. and everything else. Yeah. Oh, that place was a zoo. Yeah. Never have I ever punched a teammate or got punched by a teammate. 
Uh, no. You didn't play with Michael Barrett. I did. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You did. <laughs> yeah, but but Michael's my boy, so I didn't punch him or he didn't punch me. <laughs> <laughs> you guys seem pretty level-headed. Uh, how about never have ever pitched hungover or under the influence? Uh, I'm sure it must have been something where I, I, I being that mop up guy or the reliever, you know, where you think, oh, I threw three innings yesterday. I'm not getting up today. And you go out and have a good time. And then next, you know, the, you're up in the first inning, somebody goes down and you got to get out there. Uh, yeah. It, we've definitely both done that before. I pitched hungover twice, Scott. You, I'll, I'll give you the cliff notes versions of both those stories. Yeah. The first time was the Sunday night ESPN game Mets versus Yankees. I had already pitched, and it was the last game before the All-Star break, and I walked into the clubhouse, and Rick Reed was sitting on the trainer's table and couldn't move his neck. And so I was out the night before having dinner, drinking wine. My All-Star break started. Greatest day ever, right? I'm going to go hang out and watch the Sunday night game. Well, I walked in, and Bobby V said, can you pitch tonight? And I pitched, and I actually did pretty good. I think I made it into the sixth. And the second story is after I got my 10 years in the big leagues, in Colorado, we had this huge party, and I went out with all the guys, and, and our coaches went, and everything else. And sure enough, like Biggie was saying, the next day, uh, Franklin Morales goes out and lays an egg, like in the first or the second. And I'm in the game, and I come running in, and I'm hungover. And Hurdle hands me the ball and goes, "Somehow I knew you'd be in there today." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it always finds you, right? Yeah, always finds you. Well, we hear these stories. Dallas Braden just admitted that he was hungover when he pitched his perfect game 10 years ago. David Wells, of course, famous yeah. Doc Ellis. Doc Ellis on acid. What is it about those mental... Or you don't think. You don't think. That's the day that you don't try harder. You don't think more. You just go out there and you perform. And it seems so simple, right? But and most of these guys will tell you, oh, I felt like shit. I warmed up terrible. I had nothing in the bullpen. You hear it every single time. And then what happens? They have the game of their life. Why? Because they, all that pressure was off of them of trying to be perfect. We strive for perfection. And we try to hone in because if we're not perfect, we know something bad is going to happen. On those days, you kind of just go out there with that, you know what, whatever happens, happens kind of attitude. And those wind up being your best outings or your best starts. Now, do you have the audacity to try it again next week? No, of course not. But that's what I really think it is, is that those once in a blue moon things that happen where you don't think it's going to happen, you don't think you're going to be up that day or, or, you know, you go out and you say, hey, tomorrow's the last game before the break or whatever i'm gonna go out and that's when the, usually you get called upon is something something good comes out of it and hey good things happen to good people that's what i say yeah, that's right sometimes it helps to dull the senses a little bit right when you get no out doubt, no doubt oh uh, boy this has been a pleasure i i really could talk your ears off and talk all night with you guys and uh we'll have to uh you know maybe do it again sometime I don't think baseball's coming back anytime soon. What's your prognostication for baseball in 2020 before we let you go? Go ahead, Vic. Uh, me, I think I, I think we're playing. I think we're playing. I think it's going to be an 82 game season. I think, um, you know, the, the, the logistics involved in it are so deep. The the layers of this onion go so far down that it's it's a shame when people start arguing on that very basic level, right? Oh, it's money. It's this. It's that. It's, it's not that simple. First and foremost, the health of everyone involved, because all it takes is one. What happens? They come back. One guy sick infects the whole team. Now, all of a sudden, the Chicago Cubs can't play anymore for 14 days because they're on quarantine. The whole team. It's a possibility. You have to, the logistics that are involved in this thing, they, they can't be flawed. This can't be something where let's just try it and see what happens. We're watching and we're lucky to watch what's going on in Taiwan, what's going on in Korea and, and how they're dealing with it. And so far, so good. We haven't had anything happen where it's set the league back, both those leagues. Um, so for me, I think it's, it, it's definitely going to happen. I think, uh, Baseball players themselves want to play baseball. They have been training all year long. They want to be out there. They want to be performing in front of crowds or not. That That is not going to matter to being able to go out there and compete. Uh, that's what they're paid to do. And I, I feel that they are going to both find a way to do it. Everybody's taking a loss in this. This isn't 
you know, this $1,200 stimulus check is doing nothing for, you know, everybody at large. And so when you look at um, no one standing to gain so much money from this that they can't come to an agreement and say, you know what, let's do something that works for both of us, uh, especially in this year, because it's important to just America, because baseball is that pastime that can take your mind off of things and make things seem more normal than, than what we're going through now. Figgy hit all the points. I think they're playing. I think it's 82 games. I think it's no fans. Um, I absolutely love the possibility of two more teams getting in the playoffs. I've always wanted to see a three-game series in the wild card playoff. That's 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 the yes. thing I always love. I I yep. hate the fact that guys play 162 games. I don't like one game. and done. That drives me crazy. And you know what? If you got to burn your aces and burn your pen to get through those three games, so what? That's part of the deal. So I hope that happens. I hope we see baseball. I'm itching for it. I know everybody else is. I hope so, too. And if there is a players' union issue, I'm volunteering myself as a scab. I will uh, be the Kevin Millar of 2020. I'm happy to do it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, <poor Kevin. laughs> you guys are the best. I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, stay safe over there. My best to your families. And uh, we'll be in touch. All right? All right. You thanks. It, Thank you. Glenn Good to see you, Jake. Nelson Figueroa. They gone. They out. How about this? Wow. Our latest show yet. Sorry about that. Lots to get to from Leo DeRocher to Jason DeRocher. I can talk baseball all night, clearly, and uh, those guys can too. Mets, Brewers, we got into it. We got into it. Jason DeRocher. There's a throwback. Uh, thank you to both Glendon and Nelly and Tony Zarrett at Tony Zarrett, my meme porn meme correspondent. That was a fun bit. And uh, come back Friday. You hear? This Friday night, we're live 9 p.m. with Damon John. What? Shark Tanks, Damon John, and Lane Moore from Tinder Live. Heading into your weekend, it might be our last Friday night show. Uh oh. Some announcements coming. Stay tuned for that and stay safe yourselves because if you. Suffer, so will my ratings. Good night. <laughs>